Good morning, and uh, welcome to the next session of what is turning out to be quite a rich conference. Um, and I think that we'll see that the themes that we started to talk about this morning, and in fact, many of the, th the points that were raised both in, um, in Yashim Tabak's introduction yesterday to the film and in the film itself, that these things um, are coming up over and over again in different um, media and different ways. Um, because you didn't come to hear me speak, I will immediately um, introduce our first speaker, um, Hulia Adak, um, professor at Sabanji University. Um, she was educated at Bosphorus University and the University of Chicago, so again, we have a real cross-cultural um, experience. And um, after that, she spent time in Berlin at the Wissenschaftskolleg, and today is teaching in the Cultural Studies Unit. I think unit is the right Program. One? Program uh, at Sabanji University. I've been instructed now several times that there are no departments at Sabanji University. And her work uh, engages with uh, gender and sexuality, with biography and autobiography, um, in uh, focusing um, chiefly on women writers, but not exclusively. Her talk today is called National Narrational Authority, Historical Agency, and Possibilities of Self-Representation in Turkish Women's Autobiographies. Hulia. Thank please. you very much, Amy. Um, thank you once again for the organization of this conference. Um, I don't want to list all the names involved, but Professor Sasser mainly and Amy Singer. I'd like to thank you both um, before I start. And I call this... Um, well, I, I entitled this lecture Narrational Authority, but I'm actually going to talk about absences and silences. And uh, I hear that's going to be um, a workshop that Amy is organizing uh, next year, and I think uh, she'll find a lot here that's not about writing, that's, that's about silencing. And uh, Professor Kahraman started introducing uh, this idea of uh, state-inflicted uh, culture, or what it means when identities are shaped by the state, and I'm going to talk specifically about women, and uh, uh, in a period uh, that I will uh, limit to between, let's say, the 1920s and uh, the 70s. And these will be women who are mostly extremely influential in the women's movement, um, writing about their involvement in national history and uh, in the women's movement, if they can. And um, uh, I will make references to um, uh, male autobiographies. I work on that uh, genre for a book I'm writing on, The National Myths of Turkey. And uh, most of these autobiographies narrate the transition from the empire to the nation. And uh, they're what I call the birth of the nation narratives. And uh, uh, the most ideal example of this, of course, is Mustafa Kemal's Nutuk, uh, the speech. Uh, which is a 700-page uh, uh, text that narrates how the nation was born and Mustafa Kemal's involvement and agency in the birth of the nation from the ashes of the empire. And it's mostly about severing ties with the empire than it is about talking about transition, obviously. Um, so, um, and uh, throughout the text, I question whether gender is a useful category, and I hope that in the conclusion I will prove that um, we can actually uh, categorize these texts epistemologically as uh, a different category uh, of knowledge, that there is such a thing as women's autobiographies rather than, you know, a study of autobiography at large. So let me start with 20th century autobiographical writing in the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. Until the 1980s, uh, this genre could be characterized predominantly as one used to narrate the lives of famous state, military, and political leaders, and certain women who had access to the public sphere. The thrust of such autobiographical writing was exploiting the traditional understanding of autobiography as a genre that represents factual reality on the written page as the autobiographer makes truth claims about his or her life. So the importance was on autobiographical writing rather than fictional writing because of this issue of credibility. In male autobiographies, the self-worthy of being the object of autobiography is a leader whose life is complicit in the growth and development of, or in the time of consecutive wars, in the insurance of national sovereignty. The private life is rarely addressed in these autobiographies, where the most important goal is to discuss political involvement and the significance of the autobiographer in the progress of the nation. So I'm going to start with um, 
how uh, women talk about themselves, because uh, it's going to really be different if you know the Western tradition of autobiographies. Both male and women uh, suppress uh, the body, if you will. They don't talk about their bodies, but there are two different implications for this. In male autobiographies, uh, we see a conceptualization of the self as a rational mind without the body, which is a depiction ennobling the male as the epitome of rationality. Whereas if we look at the women's autobiographies, the disembodiment of the autobiographical I is not necessarily synonymous with empowerment or the affirmation of rationality. I'm going to start with a, a hybrid text uh, in giving you details on this. It's the auto-slash-biography of Ottoman woman writer, Fatma Aliye. It's called uh, Fatma Aliye or the Birth of an Ottoman Woman Writer, uh, written by Ahmed Mitat, uh, published in 1893. And here we see, even from the outset, that the autobiographical eyes encounter with the adult body is unnarratable. It's, um, it's not there. And this basically uh, uh, determines the 20th century all the way up to the 1970s when we have autobiographical novels by women writers such as Leila Erbil, Adalet Aolo, um, uh, Let's Petekin, who starts writing and exploring um, uh, the body, sexuality, and, and so on. Now, besides the body and sexuality, women can't even talk about their private lives. And the more possibilities autobiographies open up for the public space, it, it really shrinks uh, the private sphere. Um, for instance, let's take a very famous uh, uh, woman writer. Um, Helena talked about this uh, in her introduction today. Um, Halide Edip. Uh, in, a, in a chapter where she gives us details about her educational pursuits in, in Syria in 1916, and she's actually there as a punishment for talking against uh, the unionists who, have, uh, who are organizing the Armenian deportations, um, she gives us extensive details about her educational activities in Syria. But uh, uh, when she's about to introduce her uh, second marriage, this is the information we get. So after a serious, uh, stre strenuous period of hard work, she falls ill, and she recounts in passing, I quote, It was during this week of utter sickness that I made an important decision concerning my own life. I decided to marry Dr. Adnan, end quote. So uh, we don't know when they met, you know, what kind of relationship they had, who this guy is. I mean, we know he was uh, her grandmother's doctor, but that's all we know about him. And this is all the information we get, basically, about the marriage. Um, um, so in terms of the personal life story, when we look at the personal life story, these narratives are not in line with um, a genre you might be very familiar with, the Bildungsroman, uh, because they're basically interrupted the minute the narrated eye reaches uh, adolescence. So in that respect, there's no maturation or progress of the self after this point. Um, as I said, uh, the moment of the breaking of this uh, uh, inability of narration is the 70s when we have autobiographical novels by women writers, and, and that's, that's a serious breaking point. All right, the next section is called Of Self and Nation, Borders and Border Crossings. The I, the I of narration is conflated with the nation in male autobiographies, and this conflation coincides not only with the depiction of an autonomous self but equally with the depiction of an autonomous nation present to itself. So basically, when men are writing these birth of the nation narratives, they're writing about the I nation. I did this for the nation. Uh, my agency was the most important one in the progress of the nation, etc. Et where the I and nation are uh, together. Uh, they're conflated. Now, uh, when you compare different male autobiographies, you find that there's almost a rigorous competition for, who, for who's going to be actually conflating the eye with the nation more than the other. So this actually corresponds to a political um, struggle that's taking uh, place between the political leaders themselves. And this is most evident in the autobiographies of the unionists uh, in the, th that were written in the 20s in exile, particularly of uh, Talat and Jamal Pasha's. Now, whereas unionist leaders argue for the conflation of the self and nation on the basis of their struggles in World War I and their interest in self and national preservation through the Armenian deportations, in the late 1920s, Mustafa Kemal, his political admirers and his opponents, argue for the conflation through the success of the autobiographical eye in the national struggle of Turkey against the Greeks. So this is between 1919 and 1922. It is noteworthy to add that Mustafa Kemal's Nutuk, the speech, the text I just talked about, is the conflation of I and nation par excellence. 
in line with nationalism's strict self-otherification, in all of these autobiographies, the narrative struggle to conflate the I with the nation coincides with the attempt to reify, silence, or completely obliterate the self-nation's others. Now, when we come to women writers in the 20th century, we see that they challenge this autonomous subject present to itself. Not only do they challenge that, but they also challenge the autonomous nation present to itself as they relate their definitions of self and other in more interrelated and interdependent ways. However, this does not mean that one can reduce all female writing to a single neat formula. It is significant to look at the historical and political position of each women writer to show the differences in their approach to the, to the way they define self-nation and their others. Predominantly, Turkish women autobiographers' exploration of their selves is, as I said, more in the interdependent and interrelational. This is one of the reasons why their approach to the other is less antagonistic and more embracing. Even their attempts to silence the other is replete with breaks and fissures. It is not surprising to find that a woman criticizes the unionists for the Armenian deportations in 1916, and this is Halide Edip, and gets punished for it. The same woman depicts Greek and Turkish soldiers dying in each other's arms, imagining that they must have been friends or neighbors just before the national struggle of Turkey. This Halide Edip does, even if she is on the side of the Turkish nationalists, and she's very much a part of the army, and she takes pride in actually getting a promotion in the uh, army. It is perhaps not surprising that it is again a woman who in 2004 challenges the mono-ethnic, monadic, autobiographical eyes so common to Turkish male autobiographies. Fethiye Çetin's genealogical memoir, My Grandmother, opts for a hybrid autobiographical eye, delineating the personal history of the narrator, whose grandmother, Armenian Christian till the age of nine, was converted from, uh, from Christianity to Islam in 1915 and was given a Turkish name. The narrator finds out about the grandmother's story at a later stage of her life, and she has to wait 30 years to be able to write about it. So uh, the narrator claims that uh, she's Armenian and Turkish and defines herself as mulatto. So obviously the essentialist theories of women's autobiographies do not hold for all texts in question. And if we look at one particular woman, uh, Professor Afet Inan, who was um, a history professor, and uh, her theories of uh, the Turkish race, race in the 30s are extremely important. Um, and uh, we see that in refining her theories on race, the rigid boundaries between the nation and its others, between the white Turks and the inferior races, between herself and her civilizational others had to be uh, reified and crystallized. Now I want to talk about the narration of women's import in national development, or uh, a section I entitled The Speck, the Dust, and the Tiny Woman's Work. National history starts and ends with the I, the I of male autobiographies. The solipsis story, or his story, is the driving force behind male autobiographies. Dismissed in these accounts are the role of women in the national struggle and their import not only in the establishment of the Turkish nation, but in struggling for their own rights. Women autobiographers, on the other hand, do not necessarily organize their accounts in a solipsist fashion. Women's autobiographies narrate important historical turning points even when the eye of autobiographical writing is not involved. So in lieu of this pompous, I did this uh, type of writing, women autobiographers resort to a more modest uh, eye, an unimportant uh, or trivial eye in national history. So let's look at Halide Edip, who in 1919 was actually a cult figure, and her uh, public speeches just before the national struggle, especially in Sultan Ahmed, were extremely influential in uh, catalyzing uh, people into the struggle. So even though she was a cult uh, figure at the time, um, she uh, describes herself as this tiny, unimportant figure. So basically, in the speech at the girls' college, she describes herself, and I quote, as the little, shabby, black figure, concealed under a charshaf, end quote. In the Sultan Ahmed speech, she is not a majestic figure delivering a heartening message to 200,000 people, but, and I quote, a mere speck to those human bunches above and to the human sea below, end quote. The narrator finds it so difficult to identify with the influential orator of 1919 that she narrates the entire section of the speeches in the third person, I quote. I believe that the holiday of Sultan Ahmed is not the ordinary everyday holiday, end quote. At the end of the narration of the series of speeches, the narrator announces the return to the ordinary, ordinary everyday holiday, 
I quote. And my story comes back to the first person again. For that unnatural detachment which had created a dual personality was no more. End quote. As nurse in the national struggle, her contribution is not worth much next to male nurses. I quote. Surgeon Mustafa was worth some 200 holidays. End quote. When Nizia Muitin publishes The Turkish Woman, this is a woman who's very influential in the women's movement. Um, uh, so she publishes a work that's narrating the different phases of the uh, women's movement called Turkadın or Turkish Woman in 1931. It is the first document of the history of the Ottoman Turkish women's movement and a document of women's history where 90% of the protagonists are actually women. This great contribution is only put down by the narrator herself as she praises Mustafa Kemal, and I quote. And I wrote this tiny woman's work, taking a thin ray of light from your ever-shining torch, end quote. Next section I entitled, uh, I entitled State Feminism or My Agency Belongs to Daddy. The most important thing to address here is the fact that all individual and collective struggles were appropriated uh, by state feminism. State feminism was founded upon silencing the women's movement, which was an integral part of Ottoman and later Turkish civil society. It is enough to search for the women's movement or the establishment of the women's party in the Gargantuan text, uh, which has been the primary source for official history, mainly Nutuk. The women's movement is a non-entity in this text which details the history of the national struggle and the phases of the formation of the People's Party and gives many details about the opposing party because it's, again, trying to justify uh, the acts of the independence tribunals which acted against the unionists and the, some of the members of the opposing political party. And we need not continue looking at uh, uh, male sources in order to find any information about uh, the women's movement. It actually it is a non-entity in all the uh, male autobiographies, including admirers, political opponents, etc., of that period. Now, of course, your logical question will be, well, okay, why don't you look at women's autobiographies and you can find the movement there, would be your uh, logical conclusion. And yes, but will be my answer. So, I start with a section that's called, My Life, You Have Never Been Mine. And it's actually a very important line of a, an autobiographical novel by Letfe Tekin called Nocturnal Lessons, where she cannot appropriate her life. It's been... Uh, taken over by uh, state feminism, leftism, and so on, and she's never been able to um, uh, really address feminism on her own and her own life. So, uh, an interesting place to start would be the autobiographical works written by the spiritual daughters of Mustafa Kemal, and that's where I'm going to start, who were the symbols of state feminism at this play. One such daughter is Sabiha Gökçen, who is the first woman war pilot in the world, and she considers her life in her memoir prior to her encounter with Mustafa Kemal, not worth mentioning. Basically, we have a woman who's born at the age of 13, and this is the point when she meets Mustafa Kemal. The rest of her life is thus dictated by Atatürk, his ideas, his thoughts, his will, and uh, she's motivated only by her love and devotion to him. I quote, I think of you, I understand your thoughts, I love you, I'm in your path, therefore I am, end quote. So what the French philosopher calls the Eloise complex, uh, which is about complete self-abnegation to male, male will, is uh, a, a typical characteristic of this uh, memoir. But uh, I'm going to pose the question of gender here because after Mustafa Kemal's death, uh, many of the writings, uh, especially of, a, uh, of an autobiographical nature, was of this sort, in that people started trying to write autobiographies, but it turned into biographies of Mustafa Kemal. They really could not write about the self. So we see a complete self-abnegation in narrative. Another interesting spiritual daughter is a professor I talked about just now, Professor Afet Inan. And we have a text that has recently been compiled. It's called uh, Professor Dr. Afet Inan. That's the title. It's partly memoir, and it's partly fragments of autobiographical writings by her, put together by her daughter. Um, and here, the narrator presents herself to be the only person behind the 1930 Bill of Municipal Laws, which passed and brought women the right to vote at municipal elections, and that it was her lectures on women's rights and suffrage that impacted the acceptance of this bill. However, the merit for suffrage in 1934, and this is actually a quite uh, early e year compared to uh, some of the European states, uh, and it was again uh, appropriated by state feminism, you know, they gave us political suffrage in 1934, 
But uh, the, the right for suffrage is again in this uh, text, in this autobiographical memoir given to uh, Mustafa Kemal. In another book, uh, Afet Inan prepared at the request of UNESCO, and it's written in English, called The Emancipation of the Turkish Woman, published in 1962, she does not mention uh, the women's attainment of more egalitarian civil and political rights. In 1923, when female suffrage is discussed in parliament, Afet Inan records the words of, an, uh, of, a, of a member of parliament who's against equal political rights to women, and he says, rights are not given, they are taken, and paradoxically, Afet Inan does not write the story of how these rights are taken, but a story where Ataturk gives the rights. If Afet Inan encourages women to social action, she does after the vote has been granted them in 1934. And I quote, On that day, 11 December 1934, I encourage women in Ankara to demonstrate and go to parliament to express their gratitude. End quote. Next section is about one uh, singular autobiography, and I call it Waiting for My Rights to Reign. Equally praising of Kemalism is Selma Ekrem, and you would know her because she's the granddaughter of Namu Kemal, um, who's perhaps the least politically involved of all the women autobiographers discussed in this paper. In her autobiography entitled Unveiled, the autobiography of a Turkish girl published in 1930 in New York, uh, originally published in English, she identifies emancipation with wearing the hat instead of the chashaf. She's neither involved in the national struggle nor in the women's movement. She expects her rights to be handed to her rather than being the one to actively struggle for them. Because she cannot stand the country where a woman cannot wear the hat freely and cannot work freely, she decides to leave Turkey. This escape is one of revolt at the new government in Ankara in 1923, which is asking women of the republic to be patient because the procedure of granting rights to them will be gradual. I quote, what would the attitude of the new republic towards Turkish women be? The republic was at present concerned with vital questions, and we Turkish women had to be patient, end quote. She remarks with a touch of irony, and adds that the eye of the autobiography cannot join the rest of the Turkish women in the wait, I quote. But I felt that my patience had burst at last. I could not remain in this atmosphere of doubt any longer. And she continues, I had felt chained by tradition, my country, and even members of my own family. I had no work and no opportunity in Turkey. And her resolution is, I would go to America, end quote. When she returns to Turkey after a year and a half, she is content that women can freely wear the hats and need not be segregated in public spaces. I quote, I had been prepared for a struggle, for the eternal question of the veil, and now I was told that I could wear a hat in peace and that the new government would even smile upon me for doing so. It was a new Turkey to which I had come. This was no longer the land of shackles. I had fled to America for freedom, and now America had come back with me to Turkey. Turkish women were free. When I saw them in theaters, restaurants, and cinemas, I could not believe that the pupils of my eyes were my own. The red dividing curtain in the trolleys was gone. Gone were the lattices and the cumbersome chashafs. The new republic was not only strong and united, but it was also a country where one could breathe." End quote. The next section is called Being Suffocated by State Feminism. However, there were others who could not breathe in an atmosphere that only allowed them the donning of the hats and lifting up of curtains in public spaces which separated women from men. One such figure was Halide Edip. The autobiography of Halide Edip ends in 1922, immediately at the end of the national struggle. We do not hear of her involvement in the women's movement after World War I. We do not know that she was struggling actively for suffrage in 1923. We need to analyze her exile in 1925, not motivated entirely by her husband's protest of the closing of the Progressive Republican Party, of which he was a member. This is, we're talking about Dr. Adnan. The self-imposed exile is motivated equally by Halide Edip's disillusionment that the women's movement is silenced and suffrage is not granted. And this she actually says in a couple of interviews that were conducted by foreign journalists when she was in exile. And she in turn could not become member of parliament after, uh, uh, after the women's party uh, was closed. Another woman who perhaps could not breathe in the newly founded republic was Nezia Muitin. How could she when as the founder of the first ever political party in Turkey, the Republican Women's Party, which is earlier than the People's Party, on 16 June 1923, she had to consent to the closing of the party under Mustafa Kemal's leadership with the fear that it would lessen the support for the People's Party. 
How could Nezia Muitin breathe when the Turkish Women's Union she established on 7 February 1924, fighting for women's suffrage, was asked to dissolve itself immediately after the state granted suffrage to women in 1934, dismissing the union's organizations and demonstrations that lasted over a decade? For the state in 1935, the union had no purpose left. Suffrage was granted by the state, end of the question. The union had fulfilled its task and there was no longer a need for women's organizations. And uh, this was basically what happened till the 1970s, that there was really no women's uh, organizations and activities, activism. And I'll just uh, recount a personal anecdote. Uh, in, uh, uh, in a hospital in Pandik, I met a, a volunteer who was a member of the Turkish Women's Union that had recently been established in the post-1980 period. And uh, they sent medical workers to state hospitals and teachers to schools, etc. They were all retired uh, women uh, volunteering to work in these organizations. And when she found out that I was a professor at Sabancı University, she asked me whether I knew the date of uh, the opening of the um, Women's Union and uh, its uh, founder. Uh, and I said, uh, before I found the chance to reply, obviously, she said that it was 1924 and the founder was Mustafa Kemal. So this will give you a sense of how we write uh, national history and the history of the women's movement. Now let's go back to Nezia Muitin, who I think must have found it very difficult to breathe in the newly founded republic. How does she present her situation in her autobiographical text, which is called The Turkish Woman, which is autobiographical and it's a history of the women's movement? Uh, the, text, the, the publication of the text is quite inf uh, important here. It's 1931, and this is uh, immediately after women earn their right to vote in municipality elections. And the text is quite celebratory in tone in that respect. It is a eulogy not only to the many significant women in the movement, but to the unparalleled genius of Atatürk, who is the cat catalyst, the source behind the maturation and progress of the women's movement. So uh, basically, the text opens with a photograph of uh, Mustafa Kemal, and all the reforms of the 20s are praised in this text, and uh, they are claimed to be very important for women. For instance, uh, the adoption of the Latin alphabet in 1928, the narrator sees this as uh, women's redemption. Women who were in the depths of ignorance prior to 1928 have reached the bliss of literacy with this reform. The celebration is not restricted to the narrator per se. One of the most important goals of the Turkish Women's Union, as she tells us, was to propagandize the reforms of the Republic among all the women's organizations in Europe. So in that respect, this was commonly shared. Hence, the text was written a few years prior to the second and final disillusionment, which came after the Turkish Women's Union was asked to dissolve itself and feminism was appropriated by the state. The celebratory tone probably explains why the text got published without any in impediment in the year 1931. And one of the other reasons is, let's not forget, that it's called the Turkish woman. And it's in the 30s, of course, uh, uh, the Kemalist cadre is very busy conceptualizing theories of race and so on. So uh, this uh, writing about the history of the women's movement, especially in the Ottoman period, uh, this text obviously neglects the efforts of the Armenian, uh, Greek, Jewish women who are very much a part of the uh, movement itself. So it's the Turkish woman that she's writing about, and that's probably one of the reasons why it was a very uh, sort of easily, it got easily published. So, in conclusion, what do these uh, women's autobiographies achieve? Obviously, the picture is not so grim, because the women are trying to uh, write about themselves and their involvement in the public sphere, uh, even if they're engaging in uh, severe types of auto or other types of censorship. Um, and we see a change in uh, women's autobiographies written after the 1960s and a text that I don't want to go into detail, but if you have an interest, is called uh, uh, Roman Gibi, or Like a Novel, uh, Democracy Mujadilis in the Bir Kadın, A Woman in Pursuit of Democracy, and it's by uh, Sabiha Sertel. And this is a text that's uh, a completely uh, a rebellious text, if you will. It starts with her rebellion against her mother, and she sees her mother as a slave to her father. So it's this rebellion in her childhood towards uh, any and every kind of patriarchy. Then uh, Sabia Sertel writes about her important role, especially in the struggle, because she's one of the uh, publishers of Büyük Mejma, the big journal it's called, which uh, forms an intellectual basis and political basis for the struggle itself. So uh, more and more we're getting into a story which is really appropriating the national struggle as, uh, as her own uh, story, let's say. And um, one thing that's really peculiar here is that women narrators are trying so very hard to inscribe themselves as individuals into the, this male history that their others are, interestingly enough, other women. 
So basically, if we look at uh, Halide Edip's autobiography, for, for instance, there's not a single woman that she uh, really cites um, uh, who's very influential in the women's movement. And Nizia Muitin, for instance, is a non-entity in this text. And uh, in the public speeches that she gives, there are many other influential women orators. She doesn't cite them. Sabia Sertel, unfortunately, falls into the trap of, uh, of labeling uh, Halide Edip a mandaji, uh, which is actually... Um, a nationalistic term that has uh, sort of libeled Halide Edip for years now. Uh, she basically chose the mandate over um, national autonomy in 1919, uh, and nationalist rhetoric has used this against her for decades and decades. And Sabia Sertel falls into this trap when she talks about Halide Edip. So we see women otherizing other women in their efforts of writing themselves into this national narrative. Now, in talking about women, I think we cannot escape talking about men. In most instances of autobiographical writing, we have seen that for women, not being able to write about their own historical agencies, their integral involvement in key stages of national development, their bodily or sexual experiences, is really about the threat they pose to male authority, to the cult of national leaders, to patriarchal or national honor, and to a male-centered historical narrative whose solipsist protagonist cannot share agency. And uh, basis, basically, uh, we see another instance of this when we cannot, uh, in 2004, there was an attempt to publish the letters, uh, the correspondence between Mustafa Kemal and Latifa Hanum, uh, his, uh, his wife, uh, and uh, it, it wasn't done because it would have damaged the memory of uh, Mustafa Kemal. So these patterns of silencing are still going on, even though in autobiographical writing they've been, uh, they've been stopped, let's say, in the, in the 70s, and we're going into a more uh, liberal phase. So I'm going to end with an autobiographical utopia, if you will, and it's a line uh, by Nazim Hikmet, appropriated wonderfully by Sabiha Sertel, who during the course of the Second World War uh, decides that she's going to write a private uh, journal that's not going to be seen by anybody else. Unfortunately, the journal after the war is appropriated by the fascists and not given back to her. But uh, the dream, the utopia remains. Uh, and uh, it goes like this, I quote, I announced liberty by myself to myself. From this point on, I fear no oppression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huya. I think it was a wonderful opening to this session, which might otherwise have been subtitled, in fact, uh, not Literature, Media, and Popular Culture, um, Here Are the Women. Um, so I thank you for that. I'm going to suggest that we hear um, our other two speakers, and then we'll have um, quite a block of time for discussion. I think probably um, what we will hear from them will feed into the things that we've heard from you, and, and then we can have quite an, an interesting and, and multivalent uh, discussion. Our second speaker um, in this panel is uh, Robert Finn. Um, Robert Finn has had an enormously rich career, um, which in some ways begins and now comes back around full circle to Princeton University, um, where he took his degree and is now, uh, has a joint appointment uh, in the departments of Near Eastern Studies and in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, um, where he does in fact quite different things, um, and not as we might think um, overlapping and therefore this joint appointment. He, um, in Near Eastern Studies, is a professor of Ottoman and Turkish literature, uh, and in the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, he, I think, pursues his expertise um, in uh, Central Asian uh, politics and culture, um, where he served in multiple postings as a member of the U.S. Diplomatic Service, um, most recently um, as ambassador to um, Tajikistan and then to Afghanistan. His engagement with Turkey is enormously long and rich, and I think that um, with no further ado, we will ask you for your talk on novels by Turkish women. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Amy. You're, you embarrassed me, <clears throat> which is hard to do. <laughs> and thank you, Professor Susser and Ambassador Sinir Leodou for enabling to, to come here to, to a country where I am, in, in fact, at home, <laughs> due to my wife. Um, I'm going to, to talk today about um, Turkish um, lady novelist, and I'm sure they would um, not be happy with that appellation. Uh, the rapid rise of Western cultural influence in the Ottoman Empire that began with the Crimean War transformed literary life as well. 
from the time of Zia Pasha's famous plaint, I wandered through the infidel lands and saw palaces and fairy castles. I traveled through the lands of Islam and all was ruin and devastation. To the first novel written by a Muslim Turk, the romance of Talat and Fitnat, published in 1872, was less than a generation. Already in this first novel were the elements of social concerns and the relations between East and West that remain as leitmotifs of Turkish fiction. The plot concerns the marriage of a young woman to a wealthy old man and her relations with her lover Talat. Her mother complains, Oh, we poor women. When we get married, we think we're getting a husband or a companion, but the men don't look at us that way. When they get married, they give less attention to their wives than to a horse or a carriage they would buy. Yes, they're right, too. Because if they buy a horse and it turns out to be no good, they'll have to sell it again. But they may not be able to sell it at the same price, so they're afraid of taking a loss. However, if a woman doesn't turn out to be good, if she doesn't turn out to be suitable to his temperament, they leave them without any loss. They take other, better ones. Therefore, they don't even consider us as animals. But what can we do? They control things. They can do whatever they want. Within another 20 years, Turkish women authors began to produce novels that analyzed the social and political issues of their day, especially with regards to women. Last year at Princeton, my student Mehmet Darakciolu and I spent a semester doing textual analyses of an extensive sampling of Turkish novels written by women. I would like to share with you today a brief chronological survey of some of our analysis, beginning with Levai Ahat, Scenes from Life of Fatima Aliye, published in 1897-1898. Fatima Aliye was the daughter of Ahmed Cevdet Pasha, a famous legalist, statesman, and historian. She grew up in a sophisticated intellectual milieu where, exceptionally for the time, she studied art, science, and French. She was greatly influenced by another intellectual of the day, the celebrated Ahmed Mithat Defendi, author and self-designated teacher to the nation. Fatma Aliye's epistolatory novel takes the form of letters among five women who are relatives. Each exemplifies a different attitude towards marriage, from the companionate marriage of Mihabe to the solely economic concern of Fehame. In a second set of letters, another woman discovers that not only is her husband a crude individual in spite of his high social rank, he is also having an affair. A third set of letters is between two young unmarried girls. The milieu of the book is the reserved world of the upper classes. The very fact of literacy among the women is an indication of this. It is also a world in which men are topics of discussion and concern, but not physically present, with the exception of one scene where one of the women discovers that her husband is having an affair with a Greek woman, a common theme in novels of the period, and apparently a common occurrence in an Istanbul increasingly influenced by life a la franga. Similarly, children hardly enter into the discussion except in terms of Fehmeh's unhappy relationship with her husband. Fatma Aliye's position is clear. She stands for traditional morality with true happiness found in a companionate marriage. As she writes, love and true happiness must be found between spouses because if love is between spouses, it is pure and wonderful. Let us consider lovers in an improper relationship. If they are married to others, they have no right to say my beloved to one another, because one of them belongs to another. But they do say my beloved in an unjustified way. Then they are at fault. They are committing a sin. It is interesting to note that Fatma Aliye avoids using religious terminology or referring to the dictates of religion in the letters, in spite of her friendship with Ahmed Midhat, who is very much the proponent of Islamic morality. In her discussion, she uses almost a clinical analysis, as when, for example, she writes as the unhappy femme of the limits of an arranged marriage. Yes, I know, too, that what a woman expects from his spouse is not just a piece of bread and a set of clothes, but friendship and harmony, which means that I didn't have the right to demand something like this from my husband. That man took me promising to feed and clothe me, and to this day he has not left me naked or hungry. Aside from this, is he obliged to please me, to serve my needs and desires? 
The importance of Fatma Ali's work is its intelligent and detached discussion of the different forms of marriage and domestic relations. However, its psychological sense of the family and family unity is weak. Faithfulness is not demanded of men, fatherhood is minimized, and divorce is not really an option for women. Its interior world is gradually illuminated by external pressures. The letters main mention social diseases a man might bring home and the ability of a mistress to intrude into polite social space for a five-cent fare on a ferry. It betrays a society in change and stress, a society, in fact, that was nearing its end. Holiday Edip Adavar, we have all heard about already today. Um, she starts her fiction by writing about the concerns of women. But the novel we chose to look at uh, was a different novel, a later novel, called Sinekli Bakal, first published in 1935 in English as The Clown and His Daughter. It attempted to present to Westerners a somewhat romanticized version of the Orient that has as its goal the synthesis of Western and Eastern moral values. The characters are carefully chosen and depicted to show the Ottoman Empire on the eve of the revolution of 1908. Rabia, the main character, is a type for a new type of Turkish woman, independent but attached to the moral values of her Islamic heritage. She may be taken as a symbol of Istanbul itself, in opposition to the famous image of Istanbul as a prostitute left by a thousand men, in Tefik Fikret's 1900 poem, Fog, Sis. The novel also reflects the influence of the thinking of Ziya Gurkab, the Turkish nationalist. The choice of Rabio, or teacher, as the main character's name, is a reference to a famous Islamic poet and mystic. Rabia grows up in the house of her strict grandfather, an imam who trains her to be a hafiz, a reciter of the Quran, which gives her social mobility. Her own father, the clan Tefik, abandons her for many years. The convention of a fatherless home is a common one in Turkish novels, which Jale Parla and I have both treated in separate works. In this case, the father returns, allowing Rabia to make the transition from her strict father-in-law's home to the more congenial atmosphere of the bakal, the shop, where she is basically in charge. What is more interesting is that Tefik, as a clown, is a cross-dresser and known in the neighborhood as Kiz Tefik, Tefik the girl. While sexual ambigu ambiguity was certainly known before this in Turkish novels, and indeed forms a strong element in the highly popular slapstick fiction of the turn of the century Hussein Rami Gurpinar, its appearance in a novel by Holiday Edip, whose stern morality incul inculcated at American missionary schools intimidated even Ataturk, is more surprising. As a plot device, it enables Rabia to have independence as well as a proper familial relationship, which the strict supervision of her grandfather, the imam, would have precluded. Rabia in the end marries Peregrini, an Italian musician whom she has met in the house of Sadim Pasha and who has converted to Islam. The synthesis of Western and Eastern values the relationship represents is a symbolic rendering of Holiday Edip's vision for a new Turkey emerging from the past. There are many references to the, in the novel to religion, indicating her concerns. In particular, the character Vehbi Effendi, a Sufi, who sees life as a divine joke and says that evil is the shadow of the light, represents for her a danger to society. Rabia says, For me, the imam is less harmful for the country than the mystic Dede. The narcotic, sleep-inducing poison in the philosophy of the dervish is more dangerous than the imam's tales about heaven and hell. The philosophy perhaps shows Adivar's sympathy for Ataturk's reforms, which closed the dervish convents, convents disbanded the Sophie, Sufi orders, and placed the official religious establishment under the control of the state. Adivar's work was intended for foreigners, and as such betrays Istanbul in an arranged and somewhat staged manner, that eliminates many of the shadows that were readily apparent to other observers of the period. It even includes some pleasant scenes with Americans living near Robert College on the Bosphorus. Nevertheless, its variety of personalities and basic morality and the strong character of Rabia have made it an enduring favorite among Turkish readers. The idealized conception of Istanbul presented by Adivar stands in contrast to Peride Jalal's sharp criticism of contemporary Turkey in Uch Kadınin Romana, the novel of three women, published in 1954. 
The point of view is that of three sisters from the intellectual class who were being disenfranchised by the Menderes government of the 1950s with its political support from the countryside and its program of inroads into Ataturk's strict secular reforms. One of the three sisters writes from Switzerland in concern, quoting a Turkish man there. In any event, he, referring to Menderes, secretly makes fun of the revolutions and democracy in Turkey. If you listen to what he says, the women are starting to wear the, wear the veil again. You can't go down the street for all the men with beards. The mosques are overflowing. And instead of music on the radio, they're playing the mevlut. Sound familiar? The context is political, but the concern of the novel is psychological. Three sisters and their lives. Fatma, a writer, is married to Mehmet, who, more or less encouraged by her, flirts with other women and finally runs off with her best friend. Belkis, the second sister, spends her life waiting for an inheritance she knows will only be modest. In the meantime, she seeks to marry a rich man, has an affair that gets into the papers, and finally gives herself to that fixture of Turkish no novels, a spoiled youth. Renan, the third sister, is half Swiss and lives and studies in Switzerland. She has a relationship with a wealthy young Swiss man, but finally goes off to Paris with the Turkish diplomat. Thus, at the end of the novel, all three sisters have sought their own fates and find themselves in, for the time, questionable circumstances. The worst, perhaps, is Belkis, who lies in her room drunk while her bedridden father is tapping on the floor, gradually slows and ceases. The father, Kadri Bey, is himself the victim of his social circumstances, spending his life in Dinkensian legal battles with relatives in Adana and unable to either provide for or control his children. The time of the novel is the early 50s, and the Truman Doctrine has just been proclaimed. Americans are beginning to appear in Turkish society, not as missionaries or teachers, but as dispensers of aid and also of many martinis. One of Belki's friends, Seniha, talks about her useful American friends. In any event, we shouldn't ruin our friendship with Walker. He really does a lot for my husband. He's introduced him to people from a lot of important companies. If he says the word, they can give him thousands of dollars from the marshal assistants. But Seniha, pra pragmatic and progressive, also making, mentions Jakub Kajri Karosmanalu's Panorama, a novel which paints a dark and critical portrait of the changes in Turkey. It is she who warns Belkis about the dangers of her actions. It is Belkis and her sisters who do not make the adjustment to the new order of things. If the Americans are giving out the money, however, the Europeans are not. Part of the familial tension res results in resentment of the sister Renan, who lives in Europe since her mother had rejected the declining economic conditions of the family home in Istanbul and returned to Switzerland. Renan receives money from the father, and the other sisters, ma sisters make anti-European remarks in return. Renan feels herself European, if only she could get rid of the sleepiness of the East. Fatma also would like to live in a civilized country, and says she is sick of discussions of the Great East and the deaths in Korea. There are long discourses in the novel about the differences between East and West and the influence of Jane Mansfield. There is also mention of many contemporary Turkish literary figures. The, worst is that the work is thus an intellectual experiment for Pedide Jalal, who had been prevented for years from, from writing a book such as this by a publisher who wanted something, as she writes, affecting, romantic. Peride Jalal's novel marks a departure for her and for Turkish women novelists who have been encouraged by socioeconomic circumstances in newspapers, mainly to, to write romantic potboilers serialized in the press. And I was hoping we were going to hear from you about Jahir Ufchok and her autobiography, one of those writers. Another one of those writers is Kedeme Nadir, perhaps the most famous of Turkish women novelists, who wrote more than 40 novels that sold more than 5 million copies in her lifetime. She was the doyenne of the romantic novel, whose works contain much useful information for understanding the psychology of Turkey in the mid-20th century. Her 1958 novel, Uykusuz Sleepless Nights, is an excellent example of her work. The plot is, as Mr. Darakci Olu noted, simple, nevertheless unconvincing. What is extremely interesting about the book is the expression of social values in Istanbul and Elaza, the two nut places where the novel is set. The contrast is immediately made between the European world of Istanbul with its mixed beaches 
and the railroad station at Yolchata, where the travelers are splashed with mud. Shafiq, the main male character, visits his old school friend and learns that Elaza is a new city with new pleasures, where, however, women could not go to the park by themselves. The neighboring villages used to be Armenian, and mention of the area's past Armenian population shadows the work. But Shafiq is part of the new Turkey, modern, progressive, and aggressively westernized. His friends, the ruling elite of Elazer, perform at concerts in the ironically named Halkevi, People's House, demonstrating the virtues of the new Turkey. The music they play is romantic music from Istanbul, Bach, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and Strauss. The locals, in contrast, play Eastern music. On an evening returning home from a visit to a, a village, the Istanbul folk amuse themselves by singing opera, as the author portrays it. This return really represented another world, a faint full moon, the carriage racing along the straight road, the merry heads within like the embers of a hearth awakening at dawn. The prelude rose up again. Then the valued soprano sang a piece from Belli's Norma that had been Turkified as the shepherd girl. As Sarah's unspecial voice didn't sound at all bad amid the rumble of the wheels and horseshoes during their inspiration from the magical beauty of the night. At the second repetition, I accompanied with my own harmless voice. One can imagine the reaction of the local residents in a society where women covered even their mouths. In any event, Shefik has already expressed his shock at the condition of women in the East. As I witnessed this oppression, I became a defender of women's rights. But this is not a novel overtly about women's rights. This is a romance. While in El Azir, Shefik gets engaged to his friend's cousin, the engagement fails when he improbably runs into his old girlfriend, Jemile, and the novel turns into a flashback of their relationship. Jemile's tale is familiar from soap operas. She is a student at the conservatory with an alcoholic uncle. She takes to singing in music halls to make money, is seduced, and then abandoned. How am I to know I'm not the first, says Rossi, the cad. Finally, Jemile marries an older man with children and moves to Elaza. In the end, she divorces him and he returns to Istanbul, where she finds Shafiq and they establish their relationship anew. There are various other traditional twists and turns to the plots, including a facilitating Greek housekeeper, an in intrusive Armenian friend, and inevitably a spy. For generations of Turkish readers, novels such as those of Kedeme Nadir were the standard. Along with the standard elements of romance literature was inherent social and political criticism that pointed out the discrepancies in society and documented change as it took place. We also see in this particular novel a rare look at the effect of Ataturk's reforms in a provincial setting. The cleavage between the westernized upper class and the long-term residents of Elaza gives an indication of the nature of Turkey's modernization, which must have been familiar to Nadir's readers, and gives the contemporary readers some clues to the sources of Turkey's current situation. In a later author, Sevgi Soysal's social criticism is the heart of her masterful 1973 novel, Yeni Shehir de Bi Öle Vakta, Noon in Yeni Shehir. Each chapter concerns a separate character as Soysal creates her tale of social and economic unrest in Ankara's central neighborhood. She ties them together in the old-fashioned oriental method of having each central a character appear briefly in the previous tale. In one example, at the beginning of Hatice Hanım's tale, just as she had decided to crash her way through the crowd gathered in front of the Grand Magazine, Hatice Hanım became annoyed when Ahmet knocked into her and muttered, May God take you. Ahmet passed by Hatice Hanım, thinking about Shukran's breasts. Hatice will later commit a little shoplifting, and Ahmet has just unsuccessfully tried for a little success, excuse me, a little sex, in a multifaceted tale that it was the same thing. A multifaceted tale <laughs> that unfolds in a series of vignettes informed by the economic difficulties and leftist politics of the 70s. Mevi Behanam, a retired school teacher, her husband, a retired professor, their children, Doan and Oljai, and their leftist friend, Ali, are the main characters. As the novel develops, Doan's friendship with Ali turns into an unfulfilled romantic liaison between Oljai and Ali. It is only in Ali's clean and quiet home in a poor neighborhood where Oljai can find happiness, a sentimental social re reference. It is also unconvincing that Oljai could visit his home without his parents present in the 1970s 
or without the neighbors being aware and most likely disapproving. The setting of Yeni Shahir in a poplar tree that is being removed is brilliantly utilized by Soy Sol to both portray her characters, articulate them in an artistic unity, and use the whole as an essay on the changes and failures of modernizing Turkey. She gives the economic background and concerns of her characters, retired Professor Sali, a native of Thessalonica, an allusion to the European Turks whose dominance of Turkey was beginning to wane in this period, has affairs and business affairs that are no longer going well. The author provides some details of comfortable property deals he had made in an earlier Ankara. Mehtap, who found herself a job at Ankara when she finished the commercial lycée, is a lower middle class girl now supporting her family with determination. Similarly, Soysal tells us of Hatice Hanım's endless search for a matching faucet in the cheaper market section of the city while determining that the merchants will never cheat her. She makes sure to clip everyone's bonus coupons without delay and get their money from the bank. Meanwhile, her son is getting mixed up in leftist politics. At the end of Soysal's novel, the poplar tree finally crashes down while all the characters are present at the scene, some on the street, some in shops or apartments, as in a miniature. The tree symbolically kills the janitor of Mevibet Hanum's apartment building. He represents the old turkey that is literally disappearing, like the poplar tree itself. An illiterate, he has been told many times by Mevi Behanem that there was no longer a place for him in Yeni Shahir. So Isal's depiction of the forces of capitalism and modernization at work is more clearly etched than Perdide Jalal's, and her writing clear and compelling. The American influence that makes its appearance in Jalal's novel has, by 1973, penetrated society to such an extent that Soysal can offer a dialogue written in a mixture of Turkish and English. I apologize for those of you who don't know Turkish. Two women in a shop are chatting. Ooh, nasıl semini cim? Just fantastic. Yakında patlayacağım. Aman ben de murim de değilim hiç. Senin neyin var? Vallahi bir şeyin yok. Sen hep böyle. Always aktifsindir. Öyle deme. It's enough artık. <laughs> Soysal's important contribution as a writer was unfortunately cut short by her early death. As an intellectual activist and author, she had much more to contribute. Holiday Nusret Zordutuna is known principally for her poetry, but she's an, also a novelist and author of the nationalist right. Her 1978 novel, Ashvez Affair, Love and Victory, is useful for its illustration of cultural differences between Eastern and Western Turkey, particularly on the question of polygamy. The hero is a young soldier who comes to Istanbul during the First World War. He becomes engaged to Zanur, whose family, a bourgeois girl, whose family resists the match because of his provincial origins. When he returns home, his mother disapproves of his marrying an Istanbul girl. According to local custom, he has been engaged since birth to his cousin Zeliha. After he is wounded in battle fighting the French at Urfa, Zeliha takes the opportunity of being in a, in a coma, of his being in a coma, to sleep with him. The author does not tell us exactly how a 16-year-old virgin manages that, but does tell us that Zinur in Istanbul breaks off the engagement after she receives a letter from the younger Zeliha begging Zinur to accept her as a second wife. If you say yes, Ibrahim will take me too. Our men don't keep to just one woman. In this Zeliha is the support of Ibrahim's mother, who discusses polygamy with her son early in the novel. She says, It was good. You're here, and, and so are the others. Ismail, Nejibe, Emine. If you got married later, we'd still be here, and maybe you'd live better. She replies, maybe, Oh, no, he continues, sorry. Maybe you wouldn't have had up to, have to put up with two more wives. And she says, Oh, one or five, they'd still come. It's the custom. Poor men even marry. God's will. Ibrahim almost shuddered at this expression of resignation. He said to himself, it's better to think this way. What a great consolation. For those of you who are concerned, Ibrahim himself never recovers from his head wound and spends his remaining years in a mental hospital, never accepting that Zinur broke off their engagement. For her part, she marries someone from Istanbul and has a normal life, only learning about Ibrahim and his death years later. The social lessons in Zolotuna's romantic novel are sadly still applicable today, and not just in eastern Turkey. 
Pinakur's 1979 novel, A Lady for Hanging, is a highly katan, is a highly interesting crime story which was found to be obscene and banned. The to- tale is told from three points of view: that of the judge Faik El Virir, the woman Melek and her lover Yalchin, the son of the gardener of Husreb Bey, whom they have killed. Each of the characters is symbolic. El Virir is the judge who convicts, who asks at the end of his portion of the novel. Do I have to take all the punishments? He has doubts about his own mother's morality and a deep distrust of women. He says, I don't differentiate between men and women, but one thing's for sure. A woman can't be a judge. Cannot. That's it. Giving, something is woman, is, giving judgment is something far beyond a woman's head. And they can't be lawyers either. Elvery thinks that Malek controls Yalchin and led him to kill Husfet Bey. Malek, the angel, refuses to defend herself. She is the daughter of a doorkeeper and his wife. Her natural father is shot, and she says repeatedly that she should have died with him. She is basically sold to his rebbe, who uses her as a sexual slave by inviting men from the neighborhood in to have sex with her while he watches. Later he marries her, but the sex continues. Yalchin, the son of the gardener of the house, is one of the young men who has sex with Milek. Later he feels sorry for her, and kills Husrev, who is wearing an antari, a long robe meant here as a symbol of decadence. Malek refuses to testify in her own defense, and the relatives want her executed, among other reasons, because Husrev has left all his property to her. There are many connections in the book with the literature and customs of Istanbul in the 19th century. Yalchin describes the staircase of the house. I know from my mother that it was a miniature copy of the one in Dolma Vance Palace, now it's turned into the rickety staircase of a fifth-rate pension. The perverted Husreb made Malek wear the clothes of his French mistress and make love in his mother's bed. His mother, of course, hated the French mistress. As in many 19th century novels, there is a French mistress, but there is no father, and there is no chronological sense of time. If we think of the novel as an allegory, Malek assumes the role of Istanbul or simply womankind. Violated repeatedly but still extant, a silent witness and testimony to continuity. The judge, his own antecedents, perhaps cloudy, represents authority. The relative society waiting judgment to seize what remains of the will. Yalchin, the son of the earth, kills his ref not because he loves Melek, but because, as the novel tells us, he will find the seeds hidden under the dry leaves and bring new life. to the end. I skipped a few things here. Uh, this has been a very incomplete look at some Turkish women novelists. We see that, not surprisingly, they concentrate on female figures. Ferit Bey in Aulu's Üçbeş Kishi is one of the relatively few fully developed male characters. In many of the novels, a father figure is missing, or as in Sinekli Bakal or Üçkadın of Lomana, a weak figure. This parallels other Turkish novels and in a society still strongly structured by the family, the absence of a father frees the characters to act on their own. The novels are informed by but not directed by the political events of their period. They are in one sense removed from the public stage. Although they're very strongly in quality, they are uniformly valuable in informing the reader about the actualities of everyday life. The conflict between the Ataturkist officials and the virtually unseen local residents in Kerem Nadir's novel and the explication of different views of polygamy in Zorlu Tunis are rare looks at the different sides of Turkish society. The study is not a feminist one, and I dare say most of the novelists concerned would object to being examined as women novelists. The point was simply to take a look at a class of novelists which is often neglected or overlooked. There are similarities of concern and point of view, and there are certainly insights into society and psychology that are rarely paralleled in male novelists. Turkish women writers have, ne- have, from the inception of the novel, distinguished themselves as at least equal to their male counterparts. Parts. So that is not an issue. Nevertheless, a look at their work reveals special aspects they possess, which help us to understand a little better this confusing thing called human nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. I think that um, already we can see the point-counterpoint uh, engagement of these two papers with um, Professor Kahraman's uh, talk this morning. And our third speaker, 
Professor Orhan Tekeliolu will pick up yet another aspect of that talk in his own um, when he considers um, aspects of popular culture. It's a pleasure to welcome Professor Tekeliolu uh, here today. Um, our students have, in fact, known him for many years, as he is um, a regular uh, feature of our um, syllabus uh, in Turkish history. Uh, his work on uh, Turkish music uh, and uh, Turkish popular music, in fact, provide us with, um, the, ba with the basis for our discussion of uh, changes in Turkish culture uh, over the 20th century. Professor Teke Liolu comes to us from the communications faculty of Izmir University of Economics, and his background is, in fact, in cultural sociology, uh, where he talks about media culture uh, and history of popular music. Uh, his own background uh, and training are um, also uh, mixed, like our other colleagues, um, from Boazici University um, to Oslo University, uh, and finally to um, Otu or uh, Metu Middle East Technical University, um, where he took his degree in sociology. He will speak today on crossroads of social mobility and popular culture in urban Turkey, TV reality shows, song and dance contests, and popular TV serials, all of which are quite familiar to uh, the Israeli and Israeli audience of uh, local television. Please. Thank you. Um, actually, Turkish TV is fun. Maybe not for the Turkish intellectuals, and, but it is definitely fun for the Turkish audience because Turkey belongs to okay, very few countries with very high percentages of TV watching, and actually it was, uh, they have done a lot of studies showing that the Turks enjoy to watch TV. When we are looking at the Turkish TV, actually the popular culture comes to the fore definitely, and we can see a lot of programs which are either uh, developed by the, I mean, the Turkish uh, writers and also certain uh, adopted programs like pop star, dance contests, and so on. There are a lot of programs. On one side, we have the serials. Some of them are actually the adaptations from the uh, Western type of serials, soap operas. Yet, we have also developed our own uh, serials that I have delivered now. It is, uh, there are two examples. One is a soap opera. It is called Rain of, uh, The Time of Rain. The other is Hajj. It's the political drama, actually. Haji is, uh, it's Haji is actually a person who paid visit Hajj duty, and it was about that one. And it's very political. But they are actually chosen because they have got all the time very high ratings. This is the main reason. Uh, and when we are looking at all these programs and uh, contests, what we are seeing is a very interesting thing. Uh, there are certain characters that are coming to the fore all the time that I am going to speak about. Those people and their characteristics and their personalities and their cultural taste, one might say. But first, uh, a little introduction to the Turkish, uh, what could I say, the TV broadcasting. And actually, up until the second half, 1990s, we have got state monopoly on the TV broadcasting. So there was actually one TV channel or uh, TV channels under the control of TRT, the Turkish Radio Television. And that ban, uh, uh, sorry, that monopoly was very important actually regarding the uh, viewer choice. But after 1990s, uh, uh, the monopoly just disappeared and there came the private channels with actually... Uh, what could I say, the, with the dominance of the popular culture and when we are looking now the percentages of the viewers regarding to the main channels, I can just give a very short introduction. Actually, the first TV broadcasting started in late 1960s, 1967, but, and the first uh, color TV broadcasting started in 1980s. But now, actually, we have got various channels. But when we are looking at the five big channels, they are not religious at all. These are the five big channels, and they are actually making up the 65% of the total viewer rate. So they are the dominant channels. And the programs I'm going to speak about from those 
big channels with very high ratings. So what about the other channels? Just uh, information. Muslim channels, one might say, or the channels with a, conservat uh, a type of a Muslim uh, conservatism are making up 10 to 12 percent of the viewers, mostly when we are looking at their daily ratings. TRT, the state, TV is making up almost 10 percent of the viewers. We have got very, I couldn't say strong, but influential news channels, channels just specialized on news. They are making up to 5 percent of the uh, viewers. And we have also got other channels, local channels, thematic channels. They are making up to 8 percent of the viewers. So this is just a rough uh, what could I say, scheme of the viewer ratings, but I'm, I, I want to speak about that 65 big chunk of the viewers. So when we are looking at the high, or the programs with the high ratings, we can just classify uh, four program formats. One is, as expected, most probably, is football. And the programs about football. These are, I mean, the soccer thing is Turkey, maybe it's also a case in Israel is a very hot topic. It is, I couldn't say it's a sport. It is basically football programs, and they are getting very high ratings. The second programs, which is also very expected, I suppose, it's the type of a programs we are mostly calling as magazine. These are the infotainment programs, basically, about celebrities, news about their life, and they are making up very important part of the viewer ratings. The third type of programs, which are actually a, a type of adaptation of the global formats, as I told you, those shows, reality shows, okay, contests, different types of contests, pop star, popular music contests, dance contests, they are also really getting very high ratings. And the fourth type of programs, which are serials, actually. Um, um, let's say 10 years ago, maybe, basically the serials, they are directly imported from states like Young and Restless. They were getting very high ratings. But now we have got our Turkish versions, and it's very wrong to think that all of them are just soap operas. Actually not. And soap operas are making just 50% of the uh, serials, but we have got very political type of serials like Okay, the Valley of the Wolves, it's a definitely very political uh, uh, type of serial. And also we have got also Hajj, this is the one I just delivered on that. It is also very political. It is, it's a type of a popular type of analysis of the Turkish society. So the first two ones, the football and the magazine, is an interesting thing because there is a combination program which has become now a format actually developed, which is called Televole. It's a very interesting program, which was discovered or invented. I don't know what it is that, because it is a very interesting term in the daily usage now, because now in daily usage we are using Televole as, as an equivalent of the term magazine. So, okay, people are saying Televole, and actually they're actually referring to magazine programs or infotainment programs about celebrities. But the idea was to combine the football weavers, they are basically male weavers, with the female weavers. So they have created a type of a program format where there were the lives of the football stars and their relations with the celebrities, the girls, whatever. So that is the program format. Interestingly enough, later on, uh, the clubs actually banned uh, football players to, to appear in those programs. So they just disappeared, but not the programs. Programs are in full scale and just continuing and getting very high ratings. So why I'm speaking about all those programs, interestingly, the contests, okay, the people who are appearing all the dance contests, pop star contests, and also football stars, also appearing in those televole type of programs. So there is a very interesting give and take with regard to the characters existing in those programs. First, I, I want to speak about the shows, reality shows, okay, Big Brother, and different versions. And 
When we are looking at those shows, we are seeing a type of an anomaly if comparing to the Western versions. It's a very good start. Because, first of all, because they are also presenting not only the contest, but uh, uh, weeks or the programs of the elections. So we are seeing there a lot of non-talented people, but they want to be in the programs. And a lot of people, they are not contesting for their individual skills, but saying that I want to, I'm good because I'm representing a typical Turkish, okay, youngster, or I am a typical uh, example of the, a, a religion in Turkey, like a Black Sea region. So they are saying that I'm a good representative of that, and you, you need to have us actually in those programs. So actually, in the contests, something similar thing is happening, and accepted as a uh, norm, actually. It's very interesting, because those programs, by definition, in the global formats, are individual contests. But in Turkey, they become the contests of the groups, certain uh, what could like geographical groups, certain uh, religious groups, because there's sometimes Alevites, and they are actually, I mean, in a way, calling for the votes from them because the SMS system is all the time in effect to be sent over, and they are saying, okay, people from uh, Black Sea, please send those messages to me. But it's very interesting in the sense that because we are seeing here a type of a community-oriented contest rather than an individual contest. And I think this is a very important anomaly that we should go over later on to theorize why this is the case. And also, in general, when we are looking at the characters or those you know, contestants in those shows, they are mostly coming from lower classes, socially very weak, and mostly the outer city or the periphery of the big cities. This is something also Professor Karaman has mentioned. This is the new dynamic of the Turkish migration process that I'm going to come back again. So, actually in the uh, papers I presented to you, you can see a type of a Bourdieuian uh, based on the Pierre Bourdieu's theories about uh, the social capital, uh, uh, economic capital, and cultural capital scheme that I applied. And uh, in that case, you can see from uh, the uh, serials, but actually in the serials, we are seeing the similar type of life histories of those people. The characters are fictional, of course, in the serials. But when you are looking at the characters, you can see that as if they are popped up from those contests. Okay, such... Serials are also representing the, the, the characters that you are actually encountering with in the contests. It's a very interesting thing. So I can just continue on the characteristics. They are very ambitious most of the time. They are, technically speaking, okay, go-getters. They want to come to the fore okay, without any, what could I say, barrier. They think they are worth becoming the winners. So this is also another interesting thing. They are all the time asking for SMS okay, messages directly and saying that you should send not only one, but more and more if you have money. If they lose, they say, we, I have lost because my supporters were not rich enough. They are not accepting the loss in any case. But this is also another interesting tendency they have. Okay, come back to the serials again. Those narrations of the serials are actually mimicking directly the life stories of the characters, as I told you, that we come across in the contestants. In every serial, we are actually seeing the characters similar to those persons. Very socially weak characters, but very ambitious. And they are all the time working against the rich people. This is also another thing which is another tendency coming from that center-periphery uh, center problematic of Turkish society. So the rich people are mostly presented as wicked. They are trying to stop those people, trying to come to the okay, better place in life. And good people are all the time, almost all the time, those weak 
social weak characters. Okay, so far is understandable, but there is also another anomaly we are getting when we are looking at the ratings. Because actually one might, okay, in the rating scales you have the A, B, C, D income levels. So, okay, for example, in states when we are looking at the typical weaver of young and restless, these are also the socially, okay, weak people. They, there is a type of a connection between the level of income and the weaving. But in Turkey, when we are looking at the viewer ratings, we are seeing another anomaly. The anomaly about the very high rating of the high income group. They like to watch all those contests, serials, as well as the poor people or the people, people under C category. This is also a very interesting tendency that requires a further theoretical clarification, I think. And when you are looking at the analysis, actually the easier analysis and most accepted one is about social mobility analysis where you can see that, of course, this is a typical example of an upward social mobility and those people are trying to okay, use that, those contests to, to come up to the social ladder in the social ladder and coming to the top in the society because it's a very short way actually comparing to the other ways we have learned in the Turkish modernization, like getting a proper education and get a good family background. But these are not such people. It's very understandable and it is good to think in that way. However, I want to use another uh, theoretical perspective. And that theoretical perspective is very much related to the idea of migration. In the keynote speech, Professor Kahraman has made a type of a periodization regarding to the, okay, uh, the political periods, on Tur period, uh, period, periods of Turkey. But I, I mean, I'm of course not against such periodization, but my periodization is very much related to actually the migration waves of Turkey. But before starting with that migration waves in Turkey historical, I want to make it three uh, underline the three different type of uh, migration which is very much related to the characters because when we are looking at the, those popping up characters in the contests and also the serials there is all the time a migration history and there are three types of migration histories we come across with the first one I want to call as inner migration this is the typical one from countryside to the urban centers the second migration I want to call is in-city migration from the outer city to the center of the city or inner city, one might say. And the third character, which is also very interesting, I want to call as back migration or back to home, homeland migration of the German third generation Turkish kids or German kids, whatever. They are also popping up in all those programs. They are also coming and showing and they want to get that talent. So this is also another interesting thing because SMS messages could also be sent from Germany. Don't forget that Turkey has a very good satellite system and if you have a dish, you can actually watch the Turkish TV from almost everywhere except Australia, as far as I know. Even in States, you can get the Turkish channels easily. So... If I am coming back that migration history of the characters, the winners, okay, most of the time, they have got that migration history back then, and the losers are actually the people who are coming from the non-migrants. In the serials, we have the similar tendency, the rich people are mostly non-migrants, and they are wicked, they are the bad characters, and the good characters are also the people who are coming with that migration history which is considered as a very good starting point. So if you are, I mean, putting together that one, migration is actually, it should be a very important theoretical topic to be combined with that new form of uh, social mobility in Turkey. So in that regard, I don't want to go to the European literature about the migration, rather I want to use American theory. 
and this is also another problematic topic in Turkey, when you want to use American theory in social sciences, you are mostly considered as a follower of Özal tradition. I'm not. Yet, I found the uh, uh, theory of Gans, Herbert, Herbert J. Gans, which is a very classical theory in, uh, what could I say, the uh, popular culture, is a very good starting point, and it is a taste theory, a theory about taste, of course, social taste, we have in our mind. Uh, and it is, he's, he's a book uh, in from 1974 called Popular Culture and High Culture. It's a very interesting book um, to understand actually the Turkish situation as well, because in that book, Gans criticizing the European theory, like the theory of Adorno, and saying that these theories are very good, maybe in the European context, because they have got almost settled society with the classes. The classes are, and their tastes are settled. But American society, when we look at it, is the society of popular culture. It is not the society of high culture and low culture, but rather it is the society of high culture and popular culture. And, or he is using that bro concept, High bro, low bro, and mid bro. This is another terminology they use, and is also very applicable in this regard. Why he asked that question? Because uh, the United States is actually made up of the migration of tastes. So he preferred to use taste culture, the term, and uh, I'm modifying that term and using the taste migrations with regard to Turkey. So. When we are looking at the Turkish history, I think there are three ways or waves of migration, taste migrations. Three waves of taste migration. The first one is from the lost lands of the Ottoman Empire to Anatolia, 19th century, in this regard. Okay, the people from the lost parts of the Ottoman Empire just came back to Turkey, not Turkey, Anatolia then. And actually, it has changed the demographic uh, structure of the country, and it became Turkified and basically Muslim uh, society, one might say. And actually, the uh, 1930s uh, um, People's Exchange uh, treaties, especially with Greece, has made that tendency further, and we have got also migration of the people from Balkans to Turkey. So there is a type of an outer from outside migration to Turkey, which is very important regarding the taste culture. And in that regard, I mean, if we look for the political figures, it is, I'm not going to come inside of that discussion, but Mustafa Kemal is a very good example of himself, of that type of migration as a political leader, because the political leaders are all the time actually representing the periphery. And Mustafa Kemal actually was uh, representing the periphery of the lost land of Ottoman Empire, and actually he has built his centrum in Ankara as well. It was a periphery vis-à-vis -vis Istanbul, which was the centrum. So this is the first political figure and the demographic transition. Of course, in that period, we know, we know very well it was the period of the nation-state building. And this is the period we have got when we are looking for the taste culture, the rise of the folk culture, which was actually... Uh, the aim of the cultural policies of the Republican period, the foundation years, and they wanted to create the folk culture, okay, against the Ottoman culture, Turkic or Turkish folk culture against the Ottoman urban culture, which was represented then by Istanbul. When I am looking for the, the period, I'm not going, to, going into the details of this discussion, we still have got, okay, if we say that this is a populist culture, populist in the sense of the folk culture, we have got also small yet very vivid culture of Istanbul as popular culture. I am making that theoretical distinction between populist and popular culture. But the first uh, genus of popular culture in the modern Turkey, established in Istanbul in 1930s, and actually my... Uh, previous uh, articles were about that uh, culture, especially regarding to the music, and it's changing. The second wave of migration 
is, of course, the migration started after 1950s. It's very much related to the political change because of the Democrat Party who came to power, but it was also a political choice to, to move country in a way, to migrate country from countryside to the urban centers, which has also created another taste culture. And this is the period where we have got the rise of popular culture in Istanbul, especially, and also the other big cities, or the cities which have got population, okay, or the migrated people. Yet, it is the period state hold at the same time the monopoly over the okay, uh, broadcasting. So there was a type of a double taste culture, the taste of the okay, newcomers, okay, which you can see the traces easily in the developing genres of 1950s, 60s, uh, popular music, popular movies, okay, in the different forms of media. Yet, on the broadcasting side, you can see the, the state-oriented culture still even in effect and controlling the system. So there's a double thing. Yet, I mean, in the popular culture side, okay, so we have got a lot of hybridities. Hybridity in the sense of those taste culture in, in their combination. So we have got, for example, uh, classical Ottoman music has changed its name and it became now called as the Turkish art music. But when you are looking at the stars of them, they are the urban stars and they are actually not following the uh, techniques of the Ottoman way of singing. So they are actually created their star system. The Hollywood movies came and likewise the Turkish movie industry developed in 60s and 70s. And this is the pace migration. But the third way that I think it is the most important one because now there is a support directly from the media started after 1990s, after the privatization of broadcasting laws. So we have got actually a new type of taste migration from outer city to inner city or the periphery of the of city to the center of the city. And actually this is that transformation explaining us why there is that rating anomaly. Actually, the high-income group in the centrum of the new Turkish urban setting are mostly the people who lived in the periphery of the same centrum 10 years, 20 years ago. So they are actually moved from the outer city to the inner city with their taste. So they are actually liking and watching and seeing all those programs and the characters. And the characters, they are popping up in the, uh, the contests are actually the candidates for that transformation from outer city to inner city. It is my theoretical, what could I say, uh, uh, finding. So what was so uh, important in all those issues? What was going on in all that transformation is very important. What would be the outcomes of that transformation? First of all, there is a new type of program of upward social mobility in Turkey accepted by people. This is something completely against the modernization expectations of Turkish Republic. In a way, the popular culture is now okay, challenging directly the Turkish modernization patterns where it was expected that you should get a proper education and an accumulated type of progress in your life and promotion. Yet now, what was expected is a sudden jump type of, uh, what could I say, upward social mobility. It is very interesting, and actually uh, this is the most powerful side of the popular culture, one might say. The second thing I might say is another outcome. Now the private channels, of course, under the control of the capitalistic culture industry, capitalistic uh, marketing, they have got a proactive relation with their audience because there is the advertisement, there is the, okay, and a type of a closed system with regard to the weaver and, or audience and the sender, the broadcasting companies which are supported by the advertisement. And there is a type of a direct relationship. Nobody is caring anymore what, the, for example, intellectuals are saying, states saying, because there is a closed system 
And if you are getting a very high rating, that program is proper. No consideration about the ethical rules or something. No, nobody cares, actually, in the media networks. So what is important is the rating numbers. And the third one, this is the thing we have to discuss, and also I want to now go back against Professor Kahraman's introduction about conservatism. Because when we are looking at the discourse of all those programs and the people who are coming and saying in the programs, in the contests, in the serials, there is a definitely very high percentage of conservative views. It is a definitely conservatism, but cultural conservatism. And, okay, so you are getting, for example, the importance of the folk Islam. You are getting the importance of what is proper, it is male-oriented, almost chauvinistic. You are getting a type of a, you know, I mean, a type of a very conservative type, cultural conservative type of Turkish society to the fore by the help of the, these media programs. So what is important for me is looking for whether there is going to be a leader, a political leader who is going to transform that uh, uh, cultural conservatism to political conservatism. If one manages that one, that person comes to the power for eternity, in my opinion, because it's very important to control the popular culture. The popular culture now is actually gripping the souls of the people. They love to watch and enjoy it. So, it was my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I think we've had three incredibly rich presentations here with much food for thought and I should think um, much, um, much material for questions um, if everybody isn't um, actually fading towards lunch. So um, I open the floor to your questions and comments, please, including um, our panelists. Yes, Hassan. I explained that too, actually, uh, in, in an earlier passage. Uh, I actually said they're really defining themselves as a, an inflated mind, and they're the rational mind. And as rational mind, they really define everything about the nation, national progress, national history, etc., etc. So in that respect, uh, the only exception to this rule is Dr. Rizanur and his uh, uh, three-volume, My Life and Memoirs. Uh, where the first volume is actually confessions, and it's very rare in Turkish autobiographical writing to find confessions. But one of the only reasons why he probably could uh, write about his confessions of every sort, I mean, you know, sexual confessions, sins, etc., etc., was because he was entrusting the text uh, to libraries in Europe and knew the text wouldn't be published in his lifetime. So he actually had that leeway over other writers whose texts would be published during their lifetime, and that would uh, mean a number of things about the person in, uh, in the public sphere. So that's the only exception I can find for male autobiographies which actually refer to you know, body politics and their bodies and so on. But he would still consider himself as the epitome of rationality. So in that respect, this volume never reduces from how he defines himself as a rational mind. It only enhances his uh, position by, uh, you know, making claims about, you know, appropriating male sexuality and, and doing it in a very celebratory manner. 
So, um, so that's the only exception. Okay, thank you for this answer. Mm. Uh, you picked up the question before I finish it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the point is, uh, uh, all right, Rosanna is an exception, we all know that, but uh, the point is, I'm not just talking about the uh, writers of the period of nationalists. Mm. Even today, mm. when you read the autobiographies written by the male uh, writers, Still, you don't see anything about uh, the values of sexuality. Mm -hmm. Does this, uh, or is this a kind of outcome of the lack of no, the notion of compassion in Turkey in, mm -hmm. in general, mm -hmm. both concerning the or, or including the uh, women in the uh, in the men? Mm -hmm. So, is it something going beyond the? Uh, national narrations and other things, of course they are very interesting, <coughs> excuse me, interesting points, mm -hmm. but is it something going beyond this and mm -hmm. becoming a kind of umbrella type of uh, mindset mm -hmm. which excludes the notion of the compassion that starts in the uh, Western literature with uh, Thomas Aquinas or, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. continues with uh, Rousseau and the is a huge literature uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the picture is that grim, actually, when you look at male autobiographies. If you look at um, the work of Muratan Mungan, there's, uh, there are a few passages where he talks about, you know, where he goes into this confessional genre, let's say. And uh, I don't think it's actually... Um, uh, I, I would say the same for uh, Orhan Pamuk's Istanbul. Uh, um, so that has a bit of the confessional and even extra textual material could help in this because Orhan Pamuk was making a lot of leeway about how naughty he was, you know, and, uh, and how his marriage wasn't going so well and when he found the right partner and that was sexually uh, pleasing that he could actually um, write about sexuality in his novels and work. So in that respect, those are at least two uh, male novelists uh, who can write write about uh, their sexualities and so on. And with, um, uh, so the confessional would obviously encompass uh, women as well. Uh, in their writings, it, it, it's become political to talk about uh, the female I and, its, and her sexuality. So in that respect, I would say now in women's fiction, you would find more of that uh, in autobiographical novels than the men because it, it's become a political statement almost. So... Um, Both in the, I mean, male writers and the, in the female writers. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Hassan if I would characterize it as fear of, of women, um, uh, unless you want to take women as a, as a trope for, for modernization itself and therefore a threat to, to a male-dominated world. But certainly in Payami's life of Fatih Harbi is a prime example in Madame Noragin and Co. too, these kind of things where you have... You have women like that, but if you look at, at other people, if you look if you look at uh, Yesho Geje, you see a different expression of that, or even Chalakushi, where you have you know the the the, the prototypical other Turk woman, it plunged into lots of problems for exactly that reason, uh, and yet the author is not afraid of her, and, and that's one of the most popular novels that, that's ever been written in Turkish. So I think you have different ways of looking at it. Um, the the the, the 
thing that's useful in what I did, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of in, in parallel to, to um, uh, what Hilya was talking about, is that you don't have autobiographies in Turkey. And I think the point you raised is a very, very valid one, and, and I, th- I agree with your underlying assumption. It's something we could discuss probably. Why didn't it happen? Is, does it come because of Christianity and the concept of confession? But uh, the reason I chose to look at them is, is as both of you have said, you find, the, you find the detail, you find the autobiography in, in, in novelistic form. So if we're going to learn about women and how women feel, I think it, it's important to look at these books, which are of you know, very varied literary value, but certainly Adelaide Auld was a, a Biedungage, or Erme Yatmak, you know, was a perfect example of, of a very autobiographical novel, even though maybe that didn't happen to her. Uh, but um, I don't necessarily see the sense of fear in, 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 in that, I, I wouldn't characterize it as fear. It's, it's um, uh, an attempt to describe something with, per, with which perhaps they're not so familiar, which is a different thing. But as you, at the end, you said um, the transition from the Konak life to, to the apartment life, and, and uh, Jakub Kajuri's Kiralik Konak is a prime example of that. And he's not afraid of the woman. She's not a very likable character, but she's the one who triumphs, uh, just as in, um, uh, which one was it? It was in, in uh, Uchkadin and Romana. It's, it's, it's sending, uh, uh, sending out the same name. Who, who, who is the woman who makes the transition to the American assisted new Turkey while the three sisters are uh, falling off uh, the thing. So I don't think the fear, but uh, concern of something that's new, is different. So what about your love, Ashton, then? Uh, the, what was the name of the protagonist uh, of Ashton? It's um, the Bihtar. Well, that's the difference. I mean, that's, that's the generational difference because in 1900, uh, uh, Ashkem Memnu, Biter, has an affair with her, her husband's uh, nephew. When it's disclosed, she finally has to commit suicide, a la Madame Bovary. Um, whereas 24 years later, Kira Likonak, uh, Seniha, has affairs up and down the street. She becomes notorious in Istanbul. At the end of the novel, the the protagonist, the heroic protagonist, has got himself killed in the in, in the First World War. She's marrying a war profiteer, and the end of the novel is that Seniha was just sleek and beautiful. You know, it's a very bitter recognition of a new age. So, so success are not always the same. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, briefly, because I think that there's okay. a few more questions. No. Right. Well, that's very interesting what you have said, but let me come to the very So, uh, what's the direction of this plot? I mean, there are masses mobs who are responsive to the TV programs, and the TV programs are part and parcel of the culture industry. And you say there are conservative things in those programs. And if somebody comes out and uh, transforms this uh, uh, conservatism, cultural conservatism, to political conservatism. All right. Then isn't that fascism? It might be. That you are looking for? No, I but... Mean, not, I'm not okay. looking for a fascism. Yes, fascism, yes. But okay, I, I, I can clarify my point. You know, my, that's my basic critic of the popular culture instead of the mass culture, what I'm saying. Mm, mm. It's a kind of proto-fascistic, uh, uh, alienated uh, cultural uh, approach. I'm not using that, you know, Adorno approach. That's why I'm, I never use the term mass culture. But what I am saying, actually, for example, Islam is not, it's not selling so well in popular culture, but nationalism sells very well. It is a very well-known fact, actually. We can easily recognize such a thing. But, I mean, it is... I mean, it's really wrong to say that that transformation could create a fascistic type of political leaders, but it can create definitely a nationalism, a very nationalistic type of political leader. Actually, I forgot to say, but they're actually uh, regarding the taste migrations, I think the people, I mean, the, the political leaders who won the elections are actually representing this, those taste migrations uh, in my mind. I started with Mustafa Kemal, and, but I went, um, for example, in the 50s, Menderes actually representing a new type of a taste from the periphery, that's why he won. And Demirel is a very good example of the migration from countryside to the centrum. And Özal is actually representing a type of a migration, taste migration from a periphery city to the 
Okay, big city. And Erdogan actually is a definitely a very good example of how outer city came to the centrum in, I mean, in every... Because he is very fond of popular culture. He used very efficiently popular culture. It was the case with Özal as well. Those people, the political leaders, are very keen on popular culture, although they never speak about it. It's my theory. But I, am, I couldn't say I'm very uh, pessimist about that, I mean, uh, danger. Thank you. Just, um, I think there was a question. Um, Orly Lubin from the Department of Literature. Exactly. It, if it comes, it comes from the migrant taste. It, it is there, but it is very hidden. It is very hidden, but if someone discovers that one, with a, I mean, a wicked political mind, that person can easily use that one. It is my danger. But, I, I mean, theoretically speaking, I am, of course, aware of those discussions, and... I am the one also teaching popular culture, of course. Uh, but, uh, I mean, technically speaking, that's, I mean, I, I think that migration idea is not applicable with the Adorno uh, theory. That's why I went to the American theory. And, of course, there is the, another version of omnivore versus univore thesis, which is a combination. I, I'm following all these. But, I mean, I understand the Turkish intellectuals that they are very afraid and they are, that's why they are using that Adorno thesis. But, I mean, um, I, I'm rather to be a sociologist rather than a political scientist. That's the main reason. <laughs> so, you basically, the reason after the question. Yes. Okay. Yes, there is possibility. Thank you. 
Um, not necessarily, I would say, because most of the women that I've looked at and most of the autobiographies that exist are really about women who've been lucky enough to be a part of this public space. So to operate in already defined spheres, um, uh, be that uh, in, as, as soldiers, as I said. I mean, not that Halide Edip was actually fighting in the war, but uh, she was actually in the front line. She was a journalist, translator, editor, nurse, etc. So she had a number of responsibilities in the war system. Um, so in that respect, I mean, she's really trying to define her role as, as a male role in that sense. Um, but much earlier, before the possibilities of, um, you know, getting an education, uh, getting a job, etc., or getting some kind of access to the uh, public sphere, uh, the early high David, for instance, uh, was writing about uh, being a good mother and how that was very important for the nation. So that was really defining a role for women. Um, you know, in, in uh, national history. And that, that part, I think, like the early, um, I would say, uh, articles of hers from 1908 to 1914 could be characterized in that respect. But uh, this is the time period when uh, a few women, at least, are getting into the professions e because of the consecutive wars as well. You know, they can become nurses and so on and so forth. So that in and of itself gives them some kind of leeway and they write about their public involvement. That's something to be proud of, and so on. Thank you. I think we have time for at least one more question. There. Yeah, please, Michael. I have a question for Mr. Finn. Do you, do you, do you uh, know uh, what was the impact uh, of this novel uh, on that issue in general? Was literature a useful means to stimulate a change at that time? That's something I'm going to be looking into more to see what the effect was. It's a whole field that, that I don't think has been studied very well uh, because people uh, tend to dismiss a lot of these novels, like the novels of Kerem and Nadir, saying it's just romanticism. But it's romanticism that affected the lives of, of mainly women all over Turkey, and, and I wanted to do more study on exactly how it did affect them. I mean, it did. We, we, we see traces in other literature references uh, too to these writers and their effect. But I don't think there's been a systematic study of, of what it might have done. Thank you. Um, do we have, okay. uh, well, I think it's been a wonderful morning, and it promises very well for the afternoon. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers, to Julia, to Robert, and to Orhan. Um, we will reconvene here at 3 o'clock. Bon appétit to everyone. Yes, very important.